Um, hello everyone and welcome to today's British Hydrological Society meeting on the winter 2019-2020 floods in New Yorkshire. This is the first in a series of online meetings that the BHS Panine Group will be hosting. My name is Victoria Coates and I'll be chairing today's meeting. So just to start with some housekeeping, please make sure that your microphone is muted and switch off your video just to let you know that the meeting is being recorded. Um, during the meeting, if you want to ask a question, please write it in the chat box. Um, at the end of the meeting, if you would like to ask a question, then please raise your hand and I will unmute you individually so that you can speak with Richard to raise your hand if you press Alt plus Y at the same time. And just to let you know, there are three different view options, full screen, speaker or gallery view. So today's programme looks like this. I'll start by giving a brief introduction to the British Hydrological Society, and then I'll pass over to Richard Maxted, who will be presenting today's talk. After Richard's talk, we will have some time for questions before closing the meeting around 1.15. So about the British Hydrological Society, the BHS's mission statement is to encourage interest, scholarship and good practice in scientific and applied aspects of hydrology and to foster involvement in national and international hydrology. In terms of what the BHS, BHS does, it recognises excellence in hydrology by offering awards and prizes and it provides learning and networking opportunities through local and national and now these online meetings. It also has a quarterly circulation newsletter. Um, BHS has a mail base email list that you can join and it's a joint sponsor of the Hydrology Research Journal. And if you're not already a BHS member, you can sign up for individual membership for around £30 a year by completing the form on the website and emailing it to the membership secretary. Um, so this slide just provides some information on the current BHS membership statistics. So Chris Holman and Peter Ede conducted an analysis of BHS members in 2019 and this map just shows an indication of the spread of members across the different BHS regions of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 30% of the BHS membership are women and 8% of members joined in 1983 which is the year that the BHS was founded. And this map just shows the location of each BHS member, broken down again by the BHS regional groups. The Oxfordshire postcodes have the largest number of BHS members, primarily in or near Wallingford, followed by Reading and Exeter postcodes. There are 22 postcode areas with no BHS members. And we have 175 members in the Pennines region with the majority of them in Leeds, Warrington and Newcastle. And if you want more information about membership stats, you can read an article in circulation number 142, which is available on the BHS website. And the Pennine Hydrological Group um, covers the whole of the north of England. And there are nine of us on the committee from a variety of different organisations and backgrounds. So I've got a quick advert for the second in the next in this series of online meetings. So the next meeting will be held on the 12th of August and will include two talks on the on an update to the NRFA. Registration for this event is now live and you can register your attendance on Eventbrite using the link on this slide. Also, we'd like to ask for your help. So if you're working on something hydrological that you find interesting or um, and you would like to do a talk uh, about the work that you've done, then please uh, email us and let us know. So today's speaker um, is Richard Maxted from the Environment Agency. Richard is the hydrology team leader for Yorkshire and manages a team of hydrologists in York and Leeds. He started with the National Rivers Authority in 1992 and then moved back to Yorkshire in 94. Richard has been involved with most of the recent hydrological events in Yorkshire, from the drought of 95, the 2000 floods, and the summer storms of 2007 and 2012. 
Since 2007, his team has produced reports describing the hydrology of each significant flood event. And today's talk is based on recently published information for November 2019 and the ongoing investigation of the February 2020 events in Yorkshire. So I'll now pass over to Richard to make a start with his talk. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, so, stop sharing. Yeah. Can you also, can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. Excellent, excellent. Right, uh, I'll begin. Uh, good afternoon to everybody and um, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, yeah, this is a talk about the floods of really November through to February um, and is based on the information that we've produced so far. Um, just to paint the start picture, um, okay, we have a small technical problem already. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, oh, not quite sure what happened there. Keyboard problems. So, the leading up to the uh, November event, we'd had a increasingly wet summer, um, really all the way through late to midsummer and into uh, the autumn. Um, September had almost no days without rain. And of course, there were the previous big events, the fourth highest event in March in bits of the uh, Wharf and the Calder, and the very large event, um, one thousand rainfall in eight hours, uh, to rain pretty heavily through October uh, until the end of October when we had between the uh, 25th and 26th, we had this very large event, something like 80 to 100% of the, I'm just gonna use my laser pointer, 80 to 100% of the long-term average rainfall for October fell in a 48 hour period. And it was concentrated on this little map. It's a high rad image, radar rainfall image. And the blue line that I'm just tracing out here is the Don catchment. And the bright line is where the rainfall fell, primarily on the mid and lower Don areas. And it produced some pretty high ranking, the third highest in the AMAX series at Doncaster, only exceeded by 2007 and autumn 2000 floods. So this is a pretty big, significant event um, and would have done us quite nicely as the uh, the flood of last winter. Um, but it was really a precursor to what happened in November. So that meant by or, the end of October, we'd had the fourth wettest June to October period on record since 1891. And if you look at the uh, current month or the last three months or the last six months, it was notably wet. So. The November event is a low pressure system and an occluded front tracking up from the southeast of England and reaches the Humber Mercury line um, and stalls and then starts to drift westwards, more southwestwards really. I've highlighted the catchment of the River Don and again, like the October event, you can see these bright areas of rainfall tracking along the lower Don and the mid Don between. Gould, Doncaster, Rotherham and Sheffield. The event itself lasted 24 hours and within that event there were some reasonably uh, bright periods, um, rainfall totals of sort of eight mils an hour, um, but it's the length of time particularly and that's borne out when you look at the ra rainfall statistics. So the map shows that for the lower, in the middle on, particularly around Rotherham and Sheffield, 120 to 140, 150% of November, the November long-term average falling in 24 hours, which is going some. 
and uh, even out as far as the estuary cell being gold, you're looking at figures of around 100% uh, and the hull as well. Um, and then further north you go, the, the less the impact. Rainfall return periods over 24 hours, somewhere between 30 and 40, except in this lower Rother, Rotherham area where it's somewhere around the uh, 50 to 70. So big rainfall event over a long period and that pushes the river levels up to something really quite spectacular. The map shows the distribution of the first and second to fifth highest POTs in rank spread widespread across the Don catchment. As you move into the Calder, it's 6 to 15th and something around great, greater than the 16th in the air. The red is the early November. The yellow is June 2007, and I've highlighted in blue the October event. So you can see that it's the second highest event after the spectacular floods of June 2007. In the Rotherham area, pretty much like the rainfall, it's the highest on record. For the lower Don, it's millimetres difference. Um, and I think you'd call them pretty much the same event. It just depends on when that 15 minute reading occurred. So this is a big, spectacular event in the historical record. In terms of flows, 600 cumex at Rotherham, uh, one in 150, 250 year return periods for much of the middle and lower Don. Um, 50 to 80 year return periods in the Rotha and even in the, the, the Dern, which wasn't largely affected, it's still 15 to 30 year return periods. Um, the peak at Rotherham at 600 cubic meters per second sort of did raise eyebrows with us a bit to start with, given that the Doncaster peak was around um, 340 to 400. But when we looked at the volume, and this is something we've really only started to do um, in recent events you can see where the the automatic that's not that dissimilar to the uh volumes accumulation at doncaster which gives us more confidence in that 600 cubic meters per second i think what is as important is if you look at where the Doncaster peak flow occurred. And you can see that, and this is something that I don't think we necessarily appreciate as much as we should do, that even after the peak, there is still very large volumes of water flowing through the Don. I mean, over the seven day period, you're talking about 100 million cubic meters, and there are some wow type numbers there about Lake Windermere being 20 feet deep and so on. This volume, plays a huge important role in affecting storage. So the top graph is Kilnhurst washlands, which lie between Rotherham and Doncaster. The dotted line is the washland level, and you can see that washland level increasing, and then it shoulders or tops out. Um, the point at which that shoulder starts is when the washlands are full, and it rises still further because the washlands and the river are now in continuity. Um, the important point is here is the washlands downstream of Rotherham are filling before the peak has arrived in Sheffield, let alone in Rotherham. So the wash, this volume of water has actually filled up those mid catchment washlands before the upstream peak arrives. And this, the more complicated lower left hand graph shows some of the regulated washlands and the gray blocks show the shutting of the gate at Canclo. And the aim here is, is they drop the regulating gate at Canclo, which throttles back the flow to allow the peak in the Don to pass through before the Rother Peak follows on after it. What's happening here is the solid line, unfortunately, is the washland on this occasion. You can see it rises very steeply and then it fills and in fact, it continues to rise because of the amount of water coming down the rother. So they had to open the regulator to allow more flow downstream in order to prevent those washlands overtopping and flooding neighboring properties. That washland again fills before the level in Sheffield, which is this dotted line, and delays the peak at 
in the river rather by something like eight hours just in from the peak coming down through Sheffield. So it performed its role, but nonetheless, those washlands were essentially full before the bulk of the water had actually arrived. This volume becomes very important when we get down to the bottom end. So the picture is Fish Lake, which flooded in this event very badly. And the best information that we have and local knowledge suggests that this is the first time the Fish Lake has flooded. It didn't flood in 2000, didn't flood in 2007, and didn't flood in October. In October, the levels at Fish Lake and at Kirk Bramwith, which is just upstream, very similar peak to that that happened in November uh, 2019. So it's similar sorts of levels. In October, it's high tide. In November, it's a lower. It's on the tide is on the increase. Although it looks flat, in actual truth, when you examine the peak level at Fish Lake, there is still a residual tidal cycle. There's about an inch of variation on it. So clearly, if it hadn't flooded in 2007, we needed to look at the difference between 2007 and 2019. The red is 2007, June 2007, and the blue is November, oh, November two example showing you just how close the hydrographs look for both events, the late June 2007 and the November 2019. And on the left-hand side is the slightly more spooky uh, graph that shows just how similar those antecedent events were the early June 2007 and the October and the just the remarkable similarities between the two events such that we decided to have a look at whether the antecedent conditions were the same in terms of reservoirs all the reservoirs were full in both events the soil moisture deficit was completely saturated in both events the June event looked for all test purposes exactly the same. Then you, this graph shows that what's driving the antecedent conditions is the one month, 14 day rainfall totals. I'm just going to check my internet there. Um, one month, 14 day totals. In the November event, it tends to be the two and three month, which reflects the uh, slightly wetter um, autumn period, the longer period of rainfall. In both cases, you've ended up with similar antecedent conditions. If we look at the actual event rainfall, um, what I've done here is just subtract one from the other and shown the difference. So in the upper Don at Langset, the 24 hour total in November 2007 was 13.6 millimeters higher than in November 2019. And what this diagram shows, or this table shows is that in the upper Don, both at Langset and at Linica, the 2007 event had more rainfall as it had in the lower Dern and the lower Don, but in that middle reach of the river Don, around the Rodhouse Mill in the lower Rother, there was about, well, it had more rainfall, particularly over the longer period, somewhere between about half an inch and an inch of more rainfall. The other point, the other key point is there is not much difference, about an inch, perhaps two an inch and a half, something like that between the two events. But the November event, the late June 2007 event was somewhat larger. When we look at the volumes and compare the volumes of the two events, very similar, as you'd expect. Um, and also the way in which that volume accumulated was very similar. So. And that has an impact on the washlands. So you can see the washlands have filled at about the same time, over the same length of time. There's the fill, and there's the continuity with the river level. And in both cases, that happened before the upstream peak arrives at terms, rainfall terms, level terms. These two events are remarkably similar, with not much to explain why different things happened at Fish Lake. The tides, which is the right-hand graft, um, the tide at Goul um, in both 2000s, late June 2007 and November 
2019 are very similar, although there is this morning tide on the second day, which is higher in 2019. If we move to the left hand side and look at this, the, um, the solid lines. The blue is and the red is June 2007. You can see high tide at the second high tide, which pushes the November event higher than the June 2007 event. And then they follow roughly similar patterns. But that doesn't explain the flooding all on its own because the October 2019 event had a higher peak than the November. And what we think is happening here is it's to do with the duration at which this high level was maintained. Such that if you look at the low tide signal in 2019, it is still higher than either of the 2007, 2007 events, suggesting that perhaps what's happening here is that even at low tide, water is continuing to flow over the bank, river banks into the washlands behind filled the washlands behind to the point where low spots in the barrier bank that protects the town from the levels in the washland is exceeded and it flows into the town whereas in october it probably flowed over the river bank at the high tide but it was able to get away from the washland and didn't overtop the washland banks and we think that's the mechanism that caused the tidal flooding at fish lake so it's to do with the volume and the tide and local conditions. Moving on, in between December and February, it continued to be very wet, 5th to 15th wettest September to January since 1891. Soil moisture deficits remain close to zero as they do every winter. Reservoirs were full, the washlands gradually emptied, and generally river flows were around average. Then we get to February. Storm Kira, I think that's how you pronounce it, that's how I pronounce it anyway. Um, the map shows 100% LTA in 24 hours in and around the Calder Leeds area and much else of the Pennine Reach is getting somewhere between 75 and 100% LTA rainfall in 24 hours. And that produces quite a lot of second highest POTs, or second highest river levels on record and in and around the Huddersfield area and at the very tops of the wharf, the Nid and the Air, um, the highest on record. Of course, the problem with February is it's not one storm, it's three at least, Storm Kira, and then seven days later, Storm Dennis, and then about another seven days later, what we call the storm with no name. Uh, which is really three little rainfall, well, three major rainfall events, but there's also some substantial rainfall events between the two as well. Um, looking at Storm Dennis on the 14th to 15th, that's another 100%, well, 80 to 100% of rainfall in 36, 48 hours, and produces river levels for that event, sort of 10th plus in many areas. So it's not as big a river level event, but it's another 80 to 100% rainfall. 48 hours and then the storm with no name produces yet another 75 to 100 percent depending where you are and what i've done here is highlighted in yellow the river levels that were achieved in that event compared with the previous events in february and you can see by and large it's a lower ranking event apart from in the wharf where it is pretty substantial in the long-term record although at netherside we do only have about 16 years worth of data. Problem is when you combine the three events. So for February as a whole, that Pennine Ridge has between four and five hundred percent of the February long-term average rainfall. Pretty much everywhere in Yorkshire had somewhere between 200 and 400 percent of the February long-term average rainfall, making it the wettest February since 1891, pretty much wherever you wanted to go. This I've put on here in blue is Kira, in brown is Dennis, and in green is the storm with no name. And the only thing to take away from this is all of those events feature in the top 25 
peaks. So you have a top 25 level event three times, each time separated by a week. That's pretty extraordinary. That has an impact. So for the month as a whole, we've just combined all those peaks and you can see there's our number ones. And pretty much the whole of those Pennine draining catchments are either first, second, third, fourth or fifth ranked events at some time during that period. For the upper part of the catchment, so this is at Richmond in blue, you can see a fairly ordinary uh, reaction, but perhaps with a slight upward trend. But when you move down to the lower reaches, for instance, at in the middle of York at Viking, you can see Kira pushes the river level up and then the period of time between each rainfall event is close enough that it basically pushes that river peak back up again as a result of each event. And that's quite important because when we look at the return period, say for the Ooza skeleton, we have a one in five year return period. So each of those peaks is about a one in five year return period, which is, you know, big, but nothing to write home about. And yet when you look at the pictures of the tidal Ooza at Kaywood, it looks like the seaside with the bridge at Kaywood being the pier sticking out into a rather muddy North Sea. Um, that's actually the road to York. Yes, there is high return periods in the colder, and that's still an area where we've got to do more work. Um, but in general, those return periods are not exceptional. They're big, but they're not exceptional. And yet, when we look at the volumes, there's suddenly the picture becomes a bit clearer. So here in blue are the skeleton flows, 15 minutes, with Storm Kira just highlighted here. So it's going back to the beginning of 2019. And you can see each of these peaks is about a one in five. But when we calculate the moving 20 day cumulative flow, so that's every 15 minutes looking 20 days back, accumulating all of the, the volume for those. What you can see is just this massive increase in volume. And when we compare uh, the volumes for uh, Skelton and Beale and Doncaster, places like that, suddenly the picture becomes, I think, much clearer. So. February 2020 sits close to November 2000 in terms of 20 day moving total volume. And that feels to me to be much more sensible and much more like explains why those pictures could be November 2000. It also highlights that, in fact, for many of our rivers, it's bigger than the Christmas 2015, January 2017. And in the Don, it's still fitting inside that. 2007, there's February, there's November 2019. So this looking at volume really does help put that lower river into context. It becomes more, even more interesting when you look at the lower air. So we had significant flooding in places like East Coic and Snaith, and there are washlands down the right bank and the left bank, or north and south. Uh, I think this is East Coet, but I wouldn't like to swear to it. Um, that uh, is produced by this effect here. So the Beal, which is the river level, is in solid blue. And you can see the river level rises in response to Kira and then over tops into the washlands, as it's meant to do. Same in Dennis, and then the same for each of the rainfall events inside the storm with no name. The dotted lines are the washlands and they're in sort of uh, fill first down to fill last level. And you can see the dotted lines, the washland levels increase and fill. And then the next storm comes along, fills them some more. Next storm comes along, fills them some more. What happened in this event was that at some point, the level at Gaudel rose rapidly and significantly. And then Gaudel washland overspilt and entered into Snaith washlands. And because of some issues with Snaith washlands, that's, that Gaudel and Snaith fill is what primarily was responsible for the flooding of the villages and the wide scale flooding in that area. The gray line is the tidal signal at Calvin Bridge in the river. And again, just to highlight, you can see this same effect as we saw in November, 2019 with 
at uh, Doncaster with this low tide signal getting pretty much swamped out. But the question is, why did this suddenly go up? And the answer lies in volume. So this is indicative. So this is the four day accumulated volumes for Lemonroid, which is some distance upstream, but is the nearest we've got at the moment. Here's the four day volume being really pushed up. And so the river has got large volumes in, overspills, fills the washlands. You get a small increase in volume, which refills the washlands. And then because you have one, two, three events in the storm with no name, you get this huge increase in volume. It exceeds the capacity of all of the previous washlands, drives forward the level in Gaudel, which then overspills and fills Snaith until the telemetry at Snaith fails. So again, by looking at volume, you can begin to understand something about how those washlands have reacted. Much work to be done on this yet. To summarise then, October 19, November 20, fourth wettest June to October since 1891, followed up by, and of course the October event was a significant event on its own, followed up by 150% LTA rainfall in November, with flows in the Don in excess of one in a hundred, and washlands overtopped in the tidal range and volume driving the fill of storage, followed by one of the latest, wettest late autumn winter period since 1891, followed by 500% of the February long-term average rainfall, three storms, the period of those storms being very close, massively pushing up the accumulated volumes to the first or second highest on record, and those volumes again swamping out the storage. That causes me to make some observations and some thinking points, and they're all questions because I don't yet necessarily have the answers. 2000, October, uh, December 2015, November 2019, and February 2020 were all low tides. What would happen if this were to happen at a spring tide? I'm not sure because you have a lower low tide but a higher high tide and I think that's something we need to think about. It just emphasizes the importance of periodicity, the, 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 the time between rainfall events in building these huge volumes that overwhelm storage. Um, and it also, of course, highlights 100 million cubic meters. Are you really going to be able to design natural flood management to deal with that? When should we be focusing on volume rather than peak? And I think the story of the five year return period in the ooze at Skelton and yet the second highest 20 day volume in, your, uh, in, in the lower ooze is worth thinking about because I think we perhaps often focus too much on peak, particularly in those lower reaches. How do we factor in this element of periodicity and volume to forecasts and warnings? Yes, our models do that to some extent, but perhaps not. We're not as conscious of it as we should be. And really, I'm just going to throw something in at the end, which is that just the, the, the number of post 2000 events that now feature in the top 15 river levels. Um, basically, the top 15 river levels are almost entirely dominated by post 2000 events. And I think that about 27 minutes is enough from me. So thank you very much. I'll hand okay. back. Um, yeah, thanks, Richard, um, for the presentation. Um, so now we'll go to questions. So, just having a look on the chat. Um, do you have any in there? Um, Rob, are you on the line as well? Do you have any in the group chat? Um, hang on. Um, there is a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, sorry. Um, so it's a question from Mike Law. Um, uh, 
um, about what you were asking, saying, Richard, about the tides. So um, is it not just about whether there's spring or neap, but also whether there's a storm surge um, associated? We need to unmute Richard. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Mike might be able to unmute as well, just to um, uh, uh, ask his question as well. Um, Mike, hello to New Zealand. Hi, <laughs> uh, Richard. Kia ora. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> for those of you that might be wondering why I'm calling in from New Zealand, I was a colleague with Richards 20 years ago. Um, yeah, so, so I noticed on one of your tidal images, Richard, or um, tidal plots, I think it was for the October one and you're comparing it to I think it's the, it the October one but there was a bit of a, a peak on one of the tides and I just wondered whether that was a storm surge associated with that event that was just pushing that tide a bit higher than the adjacent tides and it's this were, yeah that's the one yeah, so, right. it's this one here isn't it yeah I think this uh, it's only yeah. giving you an extra half me um but, the brutal truth yeah the, the, i think the brutal truth of it is is that we're not sure um i have a feeling that it may even be a combination of yeah a bit of surge um but also how much just the sheer volume of water in the river actually started to influence even the tidal signal down as far as Ghoul, which for those that don't know the catchment is not normally affected by mm -hmm. river levels. I don't know. And I think there's a, we'd have to do a bit more work to understand that. But yeah, yeah, I think that's possible. Yeah, you could get a feel from, if you maybe even took the gauge down at Hull, you know, which wouldn't be affected by the river yeah. as much. You could do, do your, your recorded level take away your astron astronomical tide and see what your residual is yeah i i have a feeling mike we might have done that and i might have forgot what we did <laughs> no, <it is. laughs> okay yeah <laughs> but it's a good point well made okay um thank you mike um so um there's a, a comment from um nick everard i don't know if he wants to Mutant. Oh, crikey. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was just eating my lunch. So, <laughs> yeah. And um, I'll start by saying really fascinating insight into, into these events. And, but um, specifically, volume. Um, you know, I, as mo most of you probably know me, I, I dedicate my efforts to trying to capture flows in the rivers and, and we put a lot of effort into peak flows. But um, my question was, do, do we, you know, are we doing all we can to understand the importance of volume during the event? And, you know, a question I was going to ask is, are, are we basing warnings on volume? And I think you posed that question yourself, Richard. So, yeah, just, just really interested to, to, to discuss that aspect, you know, in the real time understanding of the impact of volume. I, I think some of my modeling colleagues might have some more to say about that because I suppose in some respects the, the forecasting system does do that but in terms of the hydrological interpretation of events um, from a purely mechanical point of view the new hydrological archive that we have the new version of whiskey allows us to do this with relative ease to make these calculations and make these running means in a way that was much more difficult and painstaking um, and therefore, now we have the kit available, it's quite tempting just to play around with it and see what comes out. And this has popped out from that sort of experiment. So it's not something that I think is consciously checked or thought about. Um, and I think that's the point I'm raising is even if our forecasting system sort of does account for relative volume, it's perhaps not something that someone thinks, gosh, we've had a lot of volume already. Maybe we should be thinking about it. But I think my forecasting colleagues might have more to say on that. So, sorry, if I'm allowed a sort of follow up question, if no one else has you, you got can, You can, there are others, but go for it. Yeah, no, just, I mean, it sounds good that we've got that in whiskey now. Does, are you implying or stating 
that we haven't really done the volume assessment before because we didn't really have the tool? We've not done it. No, no. Yeah. And it would be very interesting. And I suspect some of my team who are on the phone at the back, well, they've done the volume assessment now as this table shows for November and January and some of those events because they've done the comparison, which is just fantastic, but they've only done it now. So we're beginning to look at this and I think there's, there's probably some mileage in this for someone actually to spend a bit of time looking at this and making decisions about how, whether we're heading up a blind alley or whether it's a worthwhile task. So I'm throwing it out there really, I suppose. And also for which catchments this would be relevant. I mean, I, I find it fascinating that you can have such big floods from such relatively small peak mm. flows and this explains why and there must be catchments that are sensitive to this kind of phenomena and some that, that just aren't and it would be really interesting to understand that a bit more. The word Tewkesbury occurs to me <laughs> in context of this. Yeah. It would be fascinating to look at that Wouldn't Gloucestershire it? floodplain and also perhaps the Somerset Washland event that we had as well. Yeah. Okay, I probably better keep yeah. quiet, finish my lunch and let someone else get a word in. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Nick. Thank you. Um, so Adam Clark, if you've if you're still here, you want to unmute? Hi Rob. Yeah, sorry, I was just following convention and uh, popping it in the chat. Yeah, no, good. But I thought you could explain your question better than I yeah, can. No, question for Richard was sort of drawing on that very high proportion of events that look to have occurred since the year 2000 and thinking about things like non-stationarity. Uh, what you think the impact will have for the standard of protection of some of our recent flood alleviation schemes and how whether we're sufficiently taking um, these sorts of trends into account in terms of allowances that we're using, which are just basically a, a simple uplift on the flows. I think, again, I'm going to defer to some of my more learned colleagues here. Um, I know that um, some of the national hydrology team in uh, the Environment Agency are looking in some detail now uh, issues around non-stationarity so i think as an organization we're very um, aware that this is something that we're going to have to look at because it's i think the evidence is beginning to stack up um, so that that's that's one area of work and I, I suspect that that's something that's going to become an area of some academic intensity in the in the in the in the, in the coming future and again in terms of then when you look at volumes well perhaps it's the same sort of thing that needs to be done with volumes if we can find a way of somehow describing a volume as a as a risk I don't know whether you can do return periods on volumes or some kind of frequency analysis on volumes I Again, I would defer to, I have O-level maths grade C, so I would need somebody with a serious amount more mathematical ability than I have to think about that one. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are any more questions, if anyone wants to um, put their hand up, if they know how to do that, or um, I'll put it on the chat, otherwise we'll Bring it to a close. Oh, here we go. Uh, um, so comment from uh, Duncan Munro, who's, who's basically saying he, they're working on them um, new lower air Don ooze upper humber forecasting models that will fully represent the floodplain and will be able to forecast levels in the floodplain. Um, Which I think implies that, that that volume accounting mechanism will have to be looked at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Richard. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. Thank you for that and, and taking the time to do that today. Um, 
and thank you um, from for Vicky for um, organising this meeting. Um, um, do you want to say anything to finish off, Vicky? Um, yeah, yes. sure. Um, yeah. yeah, I've just got a um, final slide. Just to say thanks for joining, and don't forget the next BHS meeting, which is coming up on the twelfth of August. So to sign up for that online. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining.